I have spent the past 15 and a half years trying to win over the hearts and minds of the resistance movement. I'm finally making headway with the teen and tween contingent, and I seem to be getting somewhere with a certain pragmatic eight-year-old. I like sleeping, but I don't like going to bed. Why? Well, I don't like putting my pajamas on, and I don't want to stop playing. However, the youngest maintains a tenacious descent, armed with an arsenal of petty requests, jack-in-the-box-like reflexes, and that irresistible gravelly voice requesting just one more snuggle. Like, I just want to play all day, and I wish that bedtime wasn't even real. And I could just, like, play, play, like, all day. But don't you think you'd get tired? No, like, no tired. Tired isn't a thing either? Yeah, I just... Never want to go to bed because my life is so crazy. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. I've been procrastinating this episode. I released the episode about mornings last year because I'm a morning person and I've got that part down. I intended to release this a lot earlier, but I thought if I just waited long enough, I'd actually get good at putting my kids to bed and be able to share my genius solutions with you. Or that maybe I'd interview someone who had a formula that would work for all moms everywhere. But of course, the fundamental truth of motherhood that I rediscover over and over is that there's no one solution or magic formula because we're unique moms parenting unique kids. What I finally realized, and what finally got me to write this episode, is that perhaps the fact that I'm still struggling with getting my kids to bed 15 plus years into motherhood uniquely qualifies me to bring you this episode today. I feel your pain. I know how tired you are. I know how cranky your kids are when they don't sleep. I know how cranky you are when you don't sleep. And I know how frustrating it is to understand how important it is for your kids to get enough sleep, both for their sakes and yours, but not to be able to achieve it. Bedtime is still one of the hardest things I do every day as a mom. By that time of day, I'm exhausted and just barely holding it together. I'm touched out and not in the mood to cuddle, although I usually do it anyway. I don't yell very often, but when I do, you can bet it's bedtime. But I'm happy to say that it is getting better. Most of that has nothing to do with me and everything to do with the fact that kids actually do grow up and require less micromanagement. Hallelujah. I have no babies, no toddlers, and my youngest is five. While that may not be very helpful to those of you with little ones, it's still nice to know it doesn't last forever. The other reason bedtime is getting better at my house is because of this How She Moms community. I started asking everyone I interviewed about their bedtime routines. Then, in December, I started a new thing I hope to do regularly on my Facebook page called Mom Problem Monday, where moms can join me for a quick live session. One mom will share a problem she's struggling with, and the rest of us can offer ideas to help. I went first to see how it would go, and I asked for suggestions about how to keep my youngest in bed once I put him there. I got so many great ideas, and since then I've been trying them out with great success. And of course, I've been reading up on the matter, going back to my old standby, Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Child, by Dr. Mark Weisbluth, and my new favorite, Why We Sleep, by sleep genius and neuroscientist Dr. Matthew Walker. In this episode, I'll share what bedtime looks like for several different moms, some with just young kids and some with older kids and teenagers, including some really sweet ideas about how to connect with your kids at bedtime. Then I'll share some of the advice and research that's helped me improve our bedtime routine this year. Let's jump right in to hear from some moms who, gasp, actually like bedtime. The first one I encountered in my interviews was a good friend of mine, Casey Reed. I asked her what bedtime was like at her house, expecting her to tell me how hard it is with two small children. So I was stunned when I heard this instead. Let's see, after dinner, we do jammies or bath, depending on the day. And then we will do books with Florence. Um, So she's only, you know, she's less than two. So she does books and then she's to bed by 5.45 p.m. Whoa. And I know it's been that way ever since she was little. And and then um, Oliver, we spend some more one-on-one time with him. So we will play about three games, read two or three books. And then we say our prayers, we go to bed. Um, I will tell him a story. I usually come up with a story. Um, And usually the main character is a helicopter, and helicopter represents Oliver. And then we sing him two or three songs. 
and he he goes to sleep. Yeah, we just, I mean, I just really feel like that's a good time for us to bond with him. Like him wanting to play games just is wonderful for me because I love playing games. And even though it's the same game over and over and it's pretty simple, it fulfills a little bit of my need to play games. And so our bedtime routine lasts about an hour. Uh So it's an hour of just one-on-one time. And we already know what's happening. Oh, and then he's in bed by 6.30. I love that Casey makes bedtime something she looks forward to by including activities she enjoys too. Maybe for you this is reading or coloring or just talking. For me, it's reading. So after talking to Casey, I renewed my commitment to pick books I love to read with each of my younger kids, so we both look forward to that reading time. My 10-year-old and I are reading the Fablehaven series, my 8-year-old daughter and I are reading the Harry Potter series, and I just made a rule that I'm the one who gets to pick the picture book with my youngest. Luckily, he likes my taste. (laughs) Several moms I talked to use bedtime as a time to connect with their kids. One of my favorites is from Emerald Austin, who used the bedtime routine as a way to connect and heal with her kids after a divorce. When I went through my divorce, it was just a, even though I wanted it, it was just, you know, the children were missing their father, you know, stuff like that. And it was just constant bickering. It was almost like they were angry, but they didn't know how to place their anger, you know, So, and of course, that's natural, that's normal. I don't think that that, like, I wouldn't expect any less from, you know, children. So, or even adults at that. So that's when I start saying, you know, well, what do you guys like about each other? Um, So we just basically go around the room and then say what we like about each other. And, you know, sometimes it's a physical trait, but as we kept doing it, they start saying, you know, about their personality or their talent or, you know, Mom, I love the way you cook, or, you know, I really love how tenderhearted you are. So that's something that um, we would get into every single night, and it just really helped them sleep better. It helped with anxiety. It helped with stress. It helped with the tension in the family. And then I noticed it would just start to dissipate with um, everything that they were feeling, you know, as far as, like, all that tension So I think it just even builds positivity, it builds self-esteem, you know, it just builds a lot of things amongst each other. And I think it also builds a friendship with the children. Emerald has since remarried and blended two families to bring her total number of children to 10. She's one amazing woman. She also runs a cookie shop called Royal Gourmet in Long Beach, California. You can find her at royalgourmetcookies.com. Another beautiful bedtime tradition comes from my friend Lori Brescia. Bedtime is a special time, and we try to kind of bring peace and a good feeling as our kids go to sleep. And um, we started noticing that a lot of the messages out in the world were things kind of tearing our kids down, and we wanted to find a way to kind of remind them who they really are and focus on their strengths and the important things about them as their own individual. And so we started... um, something we call who are you so we got a shadow box for each of our kids Uh, we label it i am a son of god or i am a daughter of god and then they choose rocks or pebbles or you could use legos whatever they choose to fill it with and each night we ask them who are you and they start the first one is always i am a son of god and then they talk about things about them i am creative i am powerful i am forgiving i am strong i am trying to do better I am a good student, I'm caring, I'm funny, and and the list goes on. It's sometimes they're similar, sometimes we go days or weeks without repeating one of them. And it's been neat to see how they pause to reflect on who are they. In a similar vein, Joy Chantry, the mom behind the Instagram account at Joy's Fun Stuff and joysfunstuff.com, connects with her kids through prayer at bedtime. You know, they brush their teeth and whatever, and then they, they go in bed. And if we're not super late, like we usually are, then they'll read (laughs) for a little bit. Then we go in and individually, um, I'll like give them a hug and say a prayer for them, um, every night. And that, I just started doing that recently. You know, we were doing the prayer all together, but that individual prayer has actually made a huge difference in our relationship and in the feeling in our home that, cause I'll say things and, and not every night. I mean, some nights it's just like, get through it. All right. Good night. Amen. 
but sometimes, you know, you can really, I really enjoy taking that time to like, think about that child that day and where they are and, and what I'm grateful for, for them. And that's really, that's been great for them to hear that from their mom. Cause that's not something that, that comes out yeah. normally. Besides that, it's pretty, it's a pretty quick process. I'm that's not amazing. one to draw out bedtime. Yeah. <laughs> I love you all. And I'll see you yeah. tomorrow. Saren Loosely, founder of PowerOfFamilies.com, tucks her kids in with a sincere compliment every night to end the day on a sweet note, knowing that their mom appreciates them and sees the goodness in them. And Georgia Anderson learned a great lesson about connecting with her teenage son at bedtime. As my kids became teenagers, one in particular really tested his will and my agenda for him. And as we know, kids do that when they're two, and then they do it again when they're teens, and then they do a really final shift, hopefully in their early twenties, but he was doing it big time in his teens. And I got some really good advice when he was giving me absolute fits. Someone suggested that instead of trying to have a talk with him or do this or that, that I simply go down and before bed every night, give him a back rub and don't say a word. That was a huge shift for me because it again reminded me, you know, get off your high horse, get off being the person who's going to shape him um, and discover him, help him discover himself. Georgia is a parenting coach who hosts retreats for women and couples, teaches classes and workshops, and coaches individuals and families. You can find her at georgiaandersoncoaching.com and at georgiaandersoncoaching on Instagram. I am so excited this month to officially launch a series of online home management workshops to help you conquer this huge task one system at a time. The first three will be meal planning in January, laundry in February, and in March it'll be the big picture of home management, things like setting objectives, dividing household duties into different departments, figuring out your division of labor, and deciding what to outsource, things like that. The meal planning workshop will be Thursday, January 14 at 630 p.m. Mountain Time, and on Saturday, January 16th at 9 o'clock a.m. Mountain Time. Note that this is a date change from the dates I mentioned in my last episode, because I realized I didn't have enough time to let you know about them. I'm so excited to meet more of you and help you use ideas from other moms to create a real-world system that will actually work for your personality and your family situation. A video version of the meal planning workshop is already available at HowSheMoms.com if you prefer to do the course on your own time, and I'll be recording the rest of them soon as well. You can sign up for all of the above at HowSheMoms.com. I can't wait to meet you. Now let's talk bedtime routines. Of course, most of the books about sleeping recommend a consistent, predictable routine so the kids know what to expect. Ashley Brown starts bedtime for her two young daughters at 6.30 p.m. We'll go up and they get their bath. And I'm going to tell you right now, my children do not get baths every night. They get baths every other day because I'm just like, I don't think that it's necessary. And then after their bath, what we'll do is, of course, like brush my daughter's, brush both of their teeth now because my little one has two teeth at the bottom. And so we'll brush their teeth and then, of course, get them dressed. And then usually we will read a book with them. Usually I'll have conversation with my daughter as well. Like I love, like my oldest, I love talking to her and I'll ask her about her day. I think that's super important. Just kind of you know, get her, just see like what she's thinking and let her express herself before bed. And so I'll usually have some conversation with her and then uh, we will pray because we are, we have a huge faith in our family. And so um, we'll pray and then kiss goodnight and then they're going off to bed. And so that is usually our bedtime routine for the girls. And it works out pretty good. It works out pretty well. It's so funny because we just recently transitioned them to the same room. So we've been having to stagger the bedtimes a little bit. So my youngest goes down first. And then usually like 20 minutes later, my oldest goes down. Ashley is the host of the wonderful podcast, Routine and Things, where she shares her expertise for creating routines and systems to help your home run smoothly. She also designs wonderful printables and notepads to help you organize your day. Next week, I'll be releasing an episode with more of our interviews so that you can get to know her and her great ideas better. I love that Ashley brought up the issue of shared rooms, which is something I've experimented with a lot, having five kids to juggle around. My one daughter, Claire, has almost always had her own room, but for a while, I actually rotated the four boys quarterly. 
I found that different combinations helped with different things, and I also liked the excuse to move their stuff around so we could do a nice deep clean. I had four identical beds in four different rooms, so we didn't have to move furniture at all, just books and clothes. After all that moving around, we added a bedroom, so now only two boys have to share, and the final solution, after more experimentation, was surprising. I thought my oldest would want the independence of the one basement room, but he actually hated it. He's such an extrovert that he actually stayed up later, hanging out upstairs because he didn't want to go down there alone. My second son, more of an introvert, loves having his own retreat down there. And not only did my oldest want to move upstairs, he also volunteered to share a room with my youngest son. It's the sweetest thing, and they both love it. Like Ashley, I've also experimented a lot with staggered bedtimes over the years, especially when kids in the same room tended to rile each other up. Most recently, I initiated teen time, which includes my 10-year-old, even though he's not really a teen. So the three oldest boys go down to the basement to watch a show together while I put the two youngest to bed. This happened mostly because my 10-year-old is so much fun that he gets everyone riled up and jumping around if he's in the mix. Plus, it's much easier to handle two at once than three at once. Another Ashley that's good with consistent routines is Ashley Freehan, the founder of The Purpose Gathering, a community for mompreneurs with courses, events, and an online community. You can find her at thepurposegathering.com and on Instagram at thepurposegathering. She also hosts a podcast by that name. Here's Ashley. Our bedtime routine has always been very consistent. I believe wholeheartedly that a great morning starts with a great bedtime routine. And so we've always had a consistent bedtime for our kids. Our kids go to bed a lot earlier than any other kids we know, but that's okay with us. So for bedtime, we, my husband and I actually trade off on who puts the kids to bed and who does the dishes and cleans up the kitchen. And I am not even sure where I heard that, but it has been the most amazing dynamic for our family ever because there's always a clean kitchen and our kids always get one-on-one -on -one time with one of us every night as well. And so we start by having our kids, our kids actually shower before dinner because I found it to be really stressful to try to get dinner ready and then do bath and then do bed. Yeah. And so my kids actually do their bath or shower before dinner. So usually while I'm cooking dinner, they'll get that taken care of. And then my husband gets home around 545 every night. And so by the time they are showered and in their pajamas, he's home and we're eating dinner together. Usually we'll eat and then do some type of family activity, whether it is that watching a show or maybe even like playing a quick card game or something. The kids love when dad comes home, they want to play chase with him and he musters up enough energy to play with them for a few minutes because he's been working all day, right? So he plays with them for a bit and then their bedtime routine starts at about 645 and we have them go upstairs, brush their teeth, and then they each get a book that they get to pick out we read them a book and then we tuck them in, say a prayer. Um, they, they both still sleep with noise machines, that white noise, because it helps them have a deeper sleep. Even my husband needs that as an adult. So he sleeps with that. And then um, I put, we put our son to bed around seven and he is six. And then he probably doesn't fall asleep till like 7.30, sometimes 7.45, um, but that's totally fine with us because we want them to kind of get into that habit of slowing down and getting ready for sleep, even if they don't go to bed instantly. And then our daughter, who is nine, she goes to bed around 7.30, 7.45. And then again, she's probably not asleep until about 8 or 8.15. Um, but again, we just really want our kids to know that this is what happens. You guys uh, do not have to be asleep, but you do have to have your lights off and you have to be quiet. And so that has worked really well for us. And then it also gives my husband and I alone time to be able to catch up on the day, have conversation and not have the constant interruption of our kids. So that has been a game changer for us for sure, is making sure that our kids are always consistently going to bed at the same time. I love that Ashley and her husband take turns with bedtime. My friend Molly Liggett actually does the same thing with her husband, except that her kids are the ones that do the dishes. What really worked for us was to 
take turns every other night to put the kids to bed. And so at seven o'clock, we knew that the other person was free to do whatever they wanted. So if they wanted to take a bath or if they wanted to go out with friends or go to the movies by themselves, whatever they wanted to do, that was totally fine, guilt-free. And so we have been doing it for years and it has worked out great because neither of us feels like, oh, well, you went to book club this week and now you're going out with a friend. Like if it's on your night off, you can do whatever you want. And so not only for me, but for my husband, it has been wonderful. Um, Another positive aspect has been that we have gotten to have one-on-one time with our kids that we didn't get to have before. And we would do things differently than the other person did. So my husband makes up elaborate stories for the kids to tell them to bed and I read them a chapter book that we keep on reading through so our kids actually look forward to it having you know kind of a different routine when they get put to bed by having either mom or dad do it but it's always something a little different. This is another way families vary quite a bit. Some couples trade off like the last two examples, some do it together each night, and some have one appointed bedtime person. In my family that's me because my husband's schedule is so variable. Even if he's home during bedtime, he uses that time to prepare for the next day's surgery or catch up on his notes for the next day so he can spend the time right before bed with the whole family and after the kids are in bed, he can spend time with me. On the other end of the routine spectrum, from both Ashley Brown and Ashley Freehand, my friend Jen Anderson has a much more flexible and unstructured bedtime routine. We just, I guess we just like being together. I don't know. It's like... So we always read scriptures and say a prayer every single night. And we don't have like a time, but we definitely like, okay, it's close to eight. Let's do scriptures and prayer. So then we do that. And then usually we'll put the girls to bed, which takes at least half an hour because, you know, you have to like change all these diapers, get their bottles, give them a bath. Like it just takes forever. So then I should start earlier, really. But the problem is I have all these kids doing all these different things. And anyways... So I put the girls to bed and then the boys definitely kind of are the second wave. They go to bed. They're the two little um, seven and five-year-old. And then the older three usually end up helping me. And that's kind of when they open up. I'm sure you've kind of figured this out as well, is I hate to kind of crack it down because A, I like the help and B, they talk to us. They tell us what's going on. They talk about their friends, their teachers, and it's just really helpful as a parent to kind of know those things. And we don't really get to talk to them as much during the day because there's so many little kids around. So anyways, I would say our house isn't really like in bed till like 930 or 10 as far as everyone being in their room, like going to sleep. Most of the time it's in stages and I really have started to enjoy that. You know, as they get older, you realize how fast it goes. Yeah. So I like being with them. (laughs) This is a great time to talk about circadian rhythms, and we'll tell it, coincidentally enough, with the story of two Jennifers. Jennifer Anderson, whom we just heard from, is a certifiable night owl who can truly enjoy those late nights with teens. Jen Brewer, another friend of mine, is a morning lark like me. Like, I I am not a, a nighttime mom. I will not bathe my kids at night. In fact, my husband does the nighttime reading. He does the tuck-ins. My kid, if they want to say goodnight to me, they'll come and kiss me when I'm in bed. I go to sleep before almost anybody in my house. I, I'm Cruella de Vil after about eight o'clock at night. That's not my specialty. Morning mom, if you want to see me in prime, come in the early morning. I rock early morning hours. I will snuggle. I will read you books in the morning. I will get you ready in the morning. That's me. That's, that's my specialty. I'm a morning specialty mom. Jen is an author, dietitian, and speaker whom you can find at jenbrewer.com for ideas about food, travel, and finding your purpose, among other things. According to Dr. Matthew Walker's research in the book Why We Sleep, 40% of people are morning larks, with peak wakefulness early in the day, and 30% are night owls, with peak wakefulness later in the day. The rest of us are somewhere in the middle, leaning toward the side of night owls. This is not a matter of character, but biology. Everyone has their own chronotype, which is highly genetic. Few moms have it in them to be good at both morning and bedtime routines. It's more likely that one or the other comes more easily to you, and you might as well embrace it and just figure out how to make the opposite routine as efficient as possible. I know lots of moms, including Jen Anderson, who make it a part of their nightly routine to get ready for the next day. They pack lunches, backpacks, lay out clothes, etc. 
As a morning person, that sounds impossible to me. I have no problem getting stuff ready in the morning, but I do everything I can to streamline the nightly routine. It's also good to understand the circadian rhythms of our kids. As early as three to four months, babies start being governed by circadian rhythms. And by the time they're one year old, circadian rhythms get more control over their sleep. It's not till they're four years old that circadian rhythm is in total command of their sleep patterns, usually with nap and nighttime sleep. Then as they get a little older, it turns into a more monophasic pattern where they just sleep at night. Then there's another big shift in the teen years. Their circadian rhythm shifts forward, usually past their parents' bedtime. This isn't just a whim or stubbornness, it's biology. Walker says, asking your teenage son or daughter to go to bed and fall asleep at 10 p.m. is like asking you, their parent, to go to bed at 7 or 8 p.m. No matter how loud you enunciate the order, no matter how much that teenager truly wishes to obey your instruction, and no matter what amount of willful effort is applied by either of the two parties, the circadian rhythm of a teenager will not be miraculously coaxed into a change. Furthermore, asking that same teenager to wake up at 7 the next morning and function with intellect, grace, and good mood is the equivalent of asking you, the parent, to do the same at 4 or 5 a.m. He suggests that perhaps the biological reason this happens is that teenagers are in the time of life of establishing independence from their parents. This may be their body's way to give them a bit of time to themselves. Then, as we become adults, we settle into our own circadian rhythm. So while Jen Anderson's nighttime preference dovetails with her teens, making that a great bonding time for them, Jen Brewer finds other times to connect with her kids. Maria Eckersley is a mom of six kids, ranging in age from 7 to 21, so she's experienced the full range of her children's circadian rhythms. She runs the website mechmom.com with the tagline, post some products to help you be the fun mom. Do yourself a favor and follow her on Instagram and check out her website. She's got so many great ideas. Anyway, I started by asking Maria what bedtime looked like when all those kids were small. Bedtime was exhausting. It took so long. You know, I remember being so excited when Violet finally, she's our youngest, when she finally learned to shower. Because I'm like, oh, I felt such freedom to not have to have tub time anymore. <laughs> that sounds yeah. terrible. But I, that was not like my happy place. I, but I did find that if you could do certain things to make it better, you know, like I remember anytime the kids were in the bath, I would sit on the edge of the tub and soak my feet. And that was just one of those things that was like, you could relax for even just a second. You know, you got like a little, a little rejoicing moment there. Um, And those kind of things seemed to help. But when they were little, it was a very, it was much more scheduled. It was like, I needed them in bed by nine o'clock because I was exhausted and I needed some time for me, especially when Jason was traveling. It was, it was much more regimented. But now that the kids are older, I feel like you have to just roll with it. It's otherwise you lose them, right? Either you lose those like little magic moments that are kind of scattered throughout the day. So now it's different. I love her idea of soaking her feet, hearkening back to Casey's suggestion of adding in something you enjoy. I next asked Maria what their bedtime routine looks like now that her kids are older. We have this tradition where we call dibs. So somebody in the house will call dibs on putting Violet to bed and so she will often come like sneak up to me at dinner time and she'll be like, mom, I want you to call dibs. So if I call dibs, then that means I get to tuck in Violet for the night. And so then she looks forward to that for the next, you know, hour or two while we're, the night is settling down. And for for her tuck-in schedule, it's really simple. We we tend to read under her bed. I I like creating cozy spaces for my kids. So she has a loft bed that we cut down a little shorter so that it's kind of more cozy feeling underneath and then we installed some lights under it and so we try to retreat to that kind of cozy space and read and then you know I just tuck her in and we put on lullabies on the Alexa and she goes to sleep so we don't have a big schedule but I I do try to as I'm putting each kid in bed I don't follow each kid to bed because obviously I have some older kids as well but try to talk to each one of them before they get there we often do scripture study late at night so that's kind of gives us an easy gateway into talking to each one, asking about their day, and then saying prayer and connecting and then going to bed. So those kind of gateways give me an easy way to connect with each one of them. This suggestion of a cozy space got me thinking of what I could do to make our physical space more conducive to successful bedtimes. My 10-year-old had been wanting a loft bed, and the other kids wanted to paint their rooms. So my husband and I decided that for Christmas we would redo the upstairs bedrooms. We ordered bunk beds for the shared room, which haven't arrived quite yet, to give them some more room in there. We got a loft bed for my 10-year-old, and we created an art studio in my daughter's room. 
We painted all three upstairs rooms, which is a whole other story, found art and posters they love, and my husband and I spent Christmas Eve putting the rooms together. We had them all sleep in the basement that night so they could come upstairs for a fun unveiling on Christmas morning. They loved them. But perhaps the best result so far is that our 10-year-old, who's always making cozy spaces for himself all over the house, now has his own cozy space up in his loft that he loves. He's usually my night owl who can often be found creepily wandering the house once everyone else is in bed, but now he just wants to get cozy and read up there until he falls asleep. He loves it, and I love it. Right as we were creating our cozy spaces, I listened to a podcast episode that helped me think of other physical changes we could make to help us create a cozy environment as we prepare the kids for bed. It was actually probably my favorite parenting podcast episode of 2020. It was episode 164 of the Family Looking Up podcast called Parenting Tips from the World's Happiest Country with guest Jessica Joelle Alexander, author of the book The Danish Way of Parenting, which I promptly bought, and you'll be hearing more from it in upcoming episodes. Jessica talked about creating Huga in our homes, a cozy atmosphere of togetherness. I'd heard of Huga before, but I loved the way Jessica explained it as a kind of collective mindfulness, what she calls weefulness, experiencing the present moment all together. That very night, I followed her advice and dimmed the lights and put out candles for dinner. Then we worked together to clean the kitchen. Working together is also part of Huga. Then we dimmed the lights again, turned on the fireplace, and tried to really focus on being kind and calm for our family scripture study and prayer. Now my kids all know what I mean when I say it's Huga time, and it really prepares everyone for bedtime, especially the dim lights. I also learned about many other calming traditions moms use at bedtime. My sister-in-law, Allison Malstrom, often does cosmic yoga with her kids before bed to calm them down. You can find it on YouTube. My sister, Haley Kirkland, frequently turns on the podcast Peace Out to help her kids fall asleep. I tried both and use them once in a while, especially if I don't have time to read a story or if the kids are especially wired before bed. Sometimes, oddly enough, my... Youngest son just wants to listen to my podcast. Maybe it calms him to hear my voice as he's trying to fall asleep. It's pretty sweet, actually. Rebecca Brownwright suggests a great breathing exercise to help them learn how to calm down. Smell the roses for four seconds, breathing in through your nose and holding it, and then blow out the candle for seven seconds, slowly blowing out with pursed lips. This can help kids visualize how to breathe when it can be kind of a tricky concept. So getting kids into bed is one thing, Getting them to stay in bed is quite another. Molly Liggett, whom I mentioned earlier, has a rule that her kids go into the room at bedtime and they can stay up as late as they want as long as they're quiet and stay in there. If they come out or get noisy, they have to turn out the lights. This has worked really well for them and the kids usually fall asleep reasonably soon once they're in their rooms. Getting kids to stay in bed has been a big struggle for me, so I went to our Howshy Moms Facebook group for help. Speaking of which, if you're not already a member, come join us. I recorded a video in December about the problem with my youngest son having a hard time settling down and staying in bed, and I asked for advice. Since then, I've been trying out the great ideas you gave me, so thanks to all who watched and contributed. Penny Ritho suggested that I wear him out physically about an hour before bed, so I've been trying to be more conscious of how much exercise my kids are getting during the day and sending some of the older ones down to the basement with my youngest for some active time while I finish getting dinner on the table. Several moms suggested melatonin, which I haven't tried yet because we've seen such an improvement with the other things we've tried. I've known several moms who swear by it, and in the brief research I did about it, it seems that it doesn't cause dependencies and has not been shown to be harmful. I know that especially if there are sleep disorders involved, it can be helpful. In Why We Sleep, Walker recommends melatonin to counteract jet lag and for people with sleep disorders, but warns that it's not well regulated, so the amount of actual melatonin in over-the-counter brands varies widely, so you don't know how much you're actually getting. He's not suggesting that this is particularly dangerous, just unpredictable. He also says that there may be a significant placebo effect, which, hey, if it works, great. The advice that helped me shift my mindset about bedtime was from Rebecca Wright Brown, a very wise mom who I first met through her fabulous Instagram account, Pause and Connect. She's a great writer with beautiful insights into motherhood. She suggested that I try to figure out what unmet needs my son is trying to fill by coming out of bed. She said, My six-year-old often gets out of bed, and I think for him, he's lonely and bored. He has a hard time turning his mind off, so it's boring alone in his room. So when he comes downstairs, my goal is to help him feel less lonely. Oh, I miss you. This is your time to be in bed. That's something we've talked about during daytime. But please, please, please come give me a hug before you go back to bed. And then, to allay any fears of future loneliness, I'll say, Remember, I always check on you before I go to bed. If you're still awake, I'll be sure to give you a hug. 
For the boredom, she gave him the rule that he can read or play with stuffed animals in his bed until 8.30. She says, I don't think being stricter would help my boy. He just needs some sort of connection, and then he's fortified to go back to the boring room. Rebecca also suggested that I just ask my son during the daytime why he gets out of bed. So I did. We decided that he wanted some time just to talk to me. So now, when I put him to bed, I ask him if he wants talking time or reading time before he goes to sleep. This was such an important change in perspective for me, from thinking that he was getting out of bed just to be obnoxious and to torment me, to actually figuring out why it was happening. It still happens, but it happens less when he feels satisfied with the kind of attention he gets during his allotted time. We also always sing a song together, usually the same one each time. So I recorded it last night to tack on to the end of this episode. I want to end by talking about a few other mindset shifts I've had on this journey to better bedtimes. The first came from the other book I mentioned early in this episode, Healthy Sleep Habits, Happy Child by Dr. Mark Weisbluth. A friend recommended it to me when I was about three babies in, and it changed the way I thought about infant sleep. He talks about how instead of thinking of your infant's natural state as being wakefulness with periods of sleep, you should think of sleep as the natural state with periods of wakefulness. This helped me realize just how much sleep a baby needs, and I'd time their wakefulness instead of their sleep to know when it was time to help them go back to sleep. I've intentionally left out baby sleep from this episode because it's so intense that it requires its own episode, but I thought I'd include that little tip. That book also taught me how much sleep kids need at different ages and gave me several tactics for routines and troubleshooting. I go back to that book anytime my kids are having sleep problems. In addition to the other things I've already mentioned about the book Why We Sleep, the most valuable thing it has done is to change the culture of sleep in our family. My husband and I both read it in late 2019, and we declared 2020 the year of sleep, little knowing all the other things 2020 would be. Over the course of the year, we prioritized sleep more, valued it more, and we started tracking our own sleep with wristbands from Whoop. We've started valuing naps more, and we've stopped waking our kids up when they sleep in on weekends for the most part, and we've stopped teasing them about sleeping in, or thinking that they're lazy for sleeping in. I've also started to think of bedtime as a time to teach my kids how to sleep, not just a time to get them out of our hair and make sure they're not monsters the next day. It ties into several fundamental goals of parenting, keeping them healthy and teaching them how to become responsible, well-adjusted adults. It may be one of the most important things we can teach them for their physical and mental health. And most importantly, I've started to treasure bedtime with my two littles more and more as I've seen how quickly that time passed with my older kids. Before my regular sign-off, I'll leave you with a recording from last night of my youngest son's favorite bedtime song to remind you that no matter how frustrating bedtime can be, we should savor all the sweet bits. Sing what I sing, sing after me. Be my echo if you can be. Sing tra la la. Tra la la. Me, me, me. Me, me, me. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. He, he, he. He, he, he. Pick a peck of peppers. Pick a peck of peppers. Little, little dee, he, 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 he. Little, little dee, he, he, he. Be my echo. Be my echo. Sing what I sing. Sing what I sing. Follow the leader and sing Sing after me. me. Sing what I sing. Sing after me. Be my echo if you can be. Sing die, die, die. Die, die, die. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi, hi. Low, low, low. Low, low, low. Pick a pick of peppers. Pick a pick of peppers. Fiddle, little dee. Fiddle, fiddle dee. Be my echo. Sing what I sing. Sing what I sing. Follow the leader and sing, sing after, after me. me. Sing la la me me ha ha he he die die do do hi hi low la pick a pick a peppers pick a pick a peppers fiddle diddle dee fiddle fiddle dee. Be my echo. Be my echo.
go. Sing what I sing. Sing what I sing. Follow the leader and sing, sing after me. me. Sing fiddle. Fiddle. Diddle. Diddle. Dee. Dee. Dun. Good job.